Good morning, or just good afternoon. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Jolie Boche, who is uh, from the famous Plymouth, Massachusetts. I have to tell you, Jolie first caught my eye on Twitter when I thought, who is posting all these fabulous things? And then I learned that people I know have seen her present. So we have quite a treat in store with us today. Um, she is a technology integration specialist with the Plymouth Public Schools, a former elementary classroom teacher. She enjoys supporting educators with the implementation of technology to enhance lessons, engage and empower students, and streamline the workflow. She also instructs them in uh, the computer lab grades K-5 to learn about technology. As indicated by the Massachusetts Digital Literacy and Computer Science Curriculum and the ISTE standards. She's a Google for Education certified trainer, an Apple teacher, an ambassador for Seesaw, an ambassador for Flipgrid, and a BrainPop certified teacher. And one of the things you're going to learn about is she is very successful at app smashing. She received her BA in elementary education from Purdue University, which also caught my eye. She was there just a few years after I was, and her master's in instructional technology from Framingham State. You may have seen her present, as some of you have indicated in the chat. She is presenting quite a bit at various places. She has learned, earned the Tech for Learning's Innovative Educator Award. She's received a Creative Teacher Award. Um, she presented at Google Palooza last summer and PD for several different districts. So I don't want to take up any more time. And we have a newbie question for Jolie. And then I'll have her take it away. What is the difference between HyperDocs and other internet-based research tools for students, such as WebQuest? So Jolie, it's all yours. Hello, everyone. Wow, thanks for a great introduction. And thank you for having me here today. Yes, many educators have asked me about the difference between HyperDocs and WebQuest during in-services or workshops. And I think the differences between the two become more clear once you have participated in the creation or modification of a HyperDoc. So let me tell you, WebQuest were very popular during my first few years as an educator back in 1999, early 2000s. And I don't know about you, but the web class always seemed very flat. And I hate to say a little boring. The students never seemed too engaged or empowered while participating in a web quest. And in fact, many of the activities could have been replicated using a textbook or worksheet. And the final products could have been substituted using paper and pencil, for example, by creating a brochure or a poster. But HyperDocs are different. They're not just a doc or a website with links. They're engaging and empowering. And I believe there are four main ingredients that are responsible for that transformation. So collaboration is a huge ingredient in a HyperDoc. Um, I often allow students a choice to work independently or with many partners. Also, choice and voice. Ultimately, we want students to have a choice and a voice in what resources they might explore and what tools they may use to create. Also, the pacing. I like to have my HyperDocs flexible based on the needs of the student in that they are differentiated. You know, the differentiation may be based on objectives, the tools that you allow students to use, or the expectations for the final product and the student needs, or you are even considering the individual education plan of the student. So those four features, collaboration, choice, and voice, pace, and differentiation is really what sets the two apart. And, you know, for me, it's HyperDocs with the win. So thank you so much for having me here today. I hope everyone can hear me just fine. So my name is Jolie Boucher, and my role within the Plymouth Public Schools is a technology integration specialist. So currently I am privileged and very fortunate to work in a K-5 elementary school where I teach students about technology, and I also coach teachers within my building about technology integration. Sometimes I work with teachers one-on-one. -on -one. Sometimes I am helping them co-teach or model a lesson, and sometimes I'm curating resources. So it's all based on the needs and the wants of the teacher. 
Also, the technology integration specialists within my district deliver fabulous professional development to educators during in-services. And more recently, our amazing director of technology implemented an online badging system for educators to participate in online PD. So I think we have a really exceptional model in Plymouth, and that's all thanks to the vision of our director of technology, who is amazing. I, like, I, like you heard before, I'm a former fourth and fifth grade classroom teacher, and I worked in that position for around a decade. And I think my enthusiasm for EdTech brought me into that role, and I love helping teachers learn how they can work smarter and not harder. I've presented numerous workshops throughout New England. Yes, I, I was at NASCU in Plymouth. I saw that comment. Um, the Google Palooza was hosted by our district, and it was fabulous. Lots of amazing presenters there. And during the summer, I also am a featured speaker for apps events, where I present workshops across New England. So I am very honored to be here today, and I'm so excited to talk about HyperDocs with you. All my materials are available at this URL, and feel free to go to File, make a copy, and you can edit the HyperDoc and modify it and share it, take it and use it as you will. So let's get started. So as we were just saying, HyperDocs are transformed Google Docs, and I find that different educators have preferences for different G Suite tools. Some teachers love just using Google Docs. I tend to gravitate towards Google Drawings and Google Slides. Google Sheets is another popular option, and Google Forms. And all of the G Suite tools can easily be integrated in your HyperDocs. And these HyperDocs are a great way to flip your instruction or to offer blended learning opportunities in your classroom. The HyperDocs are inquiry-based. And their self-paced, the choice and voice that we were talking about earlier is huge. And the goal is to differentiate, engage, and empower your students. These are not docs with links. They are exceptional learning opportunities for our students. So the eight features that I like to include in my HyperDocs are, first, I like to activate have students activate their prior knowledge on a topic. And there are many tools that we're going to discuss that are fabulous for doing so. Flipgrid is one of my favorite tools, so we'll take a look at that later. But I think it's really important for students to think about what they already know about the topic before they start beginning the, um, the activity. Then I like to offer many different resources for students to explore, to give them the choice to collaborate with partners, or they may choose to work independently. The creation tool is huge. That's what really sets HyperDocs apart from the web quest, and that they reflect and self-assess upon their learning, share with the authentic audience. So I find that with web quests in the, in the past, students would just share with their teacher. And I don't know how motivating that was. So the goal of a HyperDoc is to share with an authentic audience. And it may be with students within the classroom. But ultimately, the global audience is where it's at. And when students know they are going to be sharing with an authentic audience, I feel like the motivation levels just skyrocket. And then, of course, to have them extend their thinking by offering different activities to enrich their ideas and their learning. So here's an example choice board that you may offer students. So when it comes to creation, when we discuss the different hyperdocs and we look at the, the segment where they're going to create something, I like to give students choices. So Google Slides is a very popular tool that students might use to um, create something. Powtoons is fabulous where they create cartoons. Google Drawings is another awesome tool. BrainPop came out with the Make a Movie feature last year, and the students love it. 30 Hands has a great tool for screencasting. Explain Everything is fabulous. Spark Video is awesome, and they recently opened that up so students can sign in with their Google ID. Shadow Puppet, EDU, another great tool. Puppet Pals, Book Creators, Sock Puppets. And sometimes teachers are intimidated because they think, well, wait a minute, I'm not an expert at all these tools. And you know what? I tell them that's okay. Provide them with a tutorial. You know, you might include a tutorial from YouTube, or maybe you're going to create your own tutorial, which would be the best feature to include here. But don't be afraid to, to tell your students that you are a novice user with these tools. Because when you empower them to show you how to use the features in these tools, they love it. And they get excited, 
And it's okay not to be the expert at every single tool because we will always have stuff to learn from our students, and that, that to me is just fabulous. So a lot of teachers use HyperDocs for blended learning opportunities within their classrooms or to flip their classroom. I know in my school we have teachers that are using HyperDocs for small group differentiation. So while the teacher is working one-on-one -on -one with students or leading a small group, she can have students at a station working on an activity. And that's a great way to differentiate within your classroom. So different groups can, can access different HyperDocs. Also, it's a great way to give students a double dose of instruction, whether it's indicated in their IEP or you just know that your students need that double dose. It's a great way to give them an activity where you don't have to give the double dose, but you can be doing something else that's very valuable within your classroom, and the HyperDocs can provide that double dose of instruction. It's a fabulous tool for enrichment. And sub plans, how many times have you just left, you know, photocopied worksheets or chapters to read because you're, you can't be there in the classroom, you are out sick or you're at a professional development opportunity, but we don't want to take that away from the students. So with the sub plans, you can leave a very detailed hyperdoc filled with activities for students to complete while they're in the classroom. And I find that teachers love this idea. I know I do that in the computer classroom. If I'm out, if I'm out sick, I can leave a HyperDoc activity there. And I can leave my screencast included in the HyperDoc. And it's like I'm still there in the classroom. So the students still have my instruction with a substitute that may not know much about technology. And then I also think it's great for differentiated homework. And I love that it's self-paced and you could, you know, assign the HyperDoc one day and, and give students time to complete each of the activities. Google Drawings is one of my favorite tools to use with HyperDocs. I think it's one of the most underrated tool in the G Suite, but it is absolutely fabulous. And I love it so much because the commenting features are still there. So instant feedback is huge. When you can give students feedback on their work instantly, they can make those changes and they can they know that somebody is looking at their work and they are interested in what they are doing. And I find that technology just allows us to give each other feedback and students respond to that. And the peer feedback is huge too because they can hear from their classmates. So I love how Google Drawings has the commenting feature in there. Also, I use the margin, you know, the gutter alongside the canvas to give the directions. And that allows me to replicate myself right there so that we can talk about each of the steps in the HyperDoc alongside. And I have been using Google Keep with my students as a checklist. So that as they complete each of the activities, they can check them off in Google Keep. So yes, Google Keep does integrate with Google Drawings, and I love it. Also, I use the virtual manipulatives in Google Drawings. The Explore tool is there, which is awesome. So yeah, you can research in Google Drawings, and students love it. It's really a one-stop shop for me. So it is one of my favorite tools to use when I create HyperDocs, especially when it comes to math. So here's an example HyperDoc that I created with a fourth grade teacher who wanted to create an activity for students that were having difficulty measuring angles. So she wanted to differentiate for those students and give them a double dose when it comes to measuring angles. So you can see there is a protractor in the bottom right hand corner and that is a PNG file. Okay, so if you insert an image into Google Drawings and you type in protractor PNG, you're going to get those transparent images that students can use while they complete the activity. So students are exploring this video. It's a screencast created by the teacher, which is awesome. But you, if you don't have time to create your own screencast, you could insert a video from Khan Academy or YouTube. And then there were opportunities for students to engage. And then they were creating here in the bottom, you can see a yellow rectangle where they had to create a an angle that measured a certain degree. And then they are going to share their thinking, use Screencastify. Now when it comes to Google Apps, Screencastify is key. So what it is, is an extension. It's a Chrome extension that you include into your HyperDocs. And when you add that in extension, students and teachers can create their own screencasts. 
And students use it to explain their thinking. So after they solve a problem or create something, they can explain what they did using Screencastify. So that is one of my very favorite tools. And I also use it all the time to create my own tutorials. Also, I think the self-assessment piece is huge. So how do the students feel about their work? And you know what? I think it's important that once they self-assess, they can go back and make changes, that they can self-assess before they turn in their work. So whether you use rubrics or just have them talk about their work, I think that's huge. And then when it comes to sharing, it all depends on what permissions you have in your classroom. Maybe they're just going to turn in their work on a Padlet wall or in Google Classroom, or they're going to email you their work, or you know, what about the global audience? Maybe they can tweet out their work on Twitter and share it with the global audience. It all depends on the ages of your students and what you are allowed to do in your district. So once again, if you want to find that transparent virtual manipulative, you're just going to go to insert image, search the web, and here you can see I typed in ruler, but I made it a PNG file so I get those transparent images. Here's another example of a hyperdoc. This was created for math as well. And we actually modified this with a Flipgrid. And what we did is we added Flipgrid in as a video directional. So the teacher recorded the directions for students using Flipgrid. And then we downloaded the video and inserted it into Google Drawings. So I'm going to show you how to do that later. But as you can see, you know, engaging the students to activate prior knowledge, number two, they're going to talk about what they learned using Vokaroo, another free, awesome tool. You go to vokaroo.com and they can record their thinking and just paste the link. It's so easy and intuitive and it's free. So then Screencastify once again in self-assessing using Google Forms. It was a huge hit. Students loved it. So a lot of you might be surprised that you can insert video into Google Drawings. I know that it was surprising to me when I figured it out one day, and it was really a game changer. So to insert video into Google Drawings, you have to start with a hack, okay? And what you do is you go into Google Slides, and you can insert video into Google Slides no problem. So once you go to insert video into Google Slides, you can choose a video from YouTube or your Google Drive, and then you just click on the video, Control C to copy it, and then you go into Google Drawings and you can paste it, Control V. And then when you double click, it works. It actually works. You can stream a video in Google Drawings. So I hope soon they will just add that option into Google Drawings where you can go to insert video. But for now, there's a short little hack. And I have a link to my website on the bottom if you want to see a video tutorial on how to do that. I do have that information at flippedtechcoaching.com and you will find a quick tutorial. But that is a great hack. So I use that hack with Flipgrid now. And as of yesterday, students can download the video. And that's great, because now they can add it to their Google Drive and add their video responses into Flipgrid and then ultimately into their HyperDoc. Huge hack, big fan of Flipgrid. So the other thing I mentioned was Google Keep. Google Keep allows you to share a checklist with students. And then students can go in and go to Tools and select Google Keep. And now they can use a checklist while completing their hyperdrawing, I call it, if we're using Google Drawings. And I think that is a really nice way to allow students to know where they are in the progression of their hyperdoc. And the great thing about using Google Keep is that now with Google Keep, you can add your notes about student work onto that note, and you can archive it. And you can share it with your co-teachers or administrators or parents. And students can also attach, if they download their work, if they go to File, Save As, a JPEG, if they save their Google drawing, they could turn their work in on this Google Keep note. So then you would have the checklist, you would have your anecdotal notes, and you would have the student work all attached to your checklist which to me is awesome and it really simplifies and helps streamline your workflow as a teacher. So here's an example of the hyperdrawing with the Google Keep note over to the right. And it just makes it really easy for the students to keep track of their work. So I really love Google Keep with our hyperdrawing. So it's a great tool. 
And this is what it would look like when the student completed the activity. They would save it as a JPEG and attach it to the Google Keep Note. And then you would have everything right there in one note. So you could offer them feedback. You could add the labels on the Keep Note. So you could label each note by student name and assignment. So you could go back and pull them up and reference them later. It's just a great reflection tool. And I prefer using Google Keep on the iPads because when you use the iPads, students can record their thinking. You cannot necessarily do that if you use it on a Chromebook or desktop. Here's another example. This is a template where students can create a cartoon comic strip. So the activity was for students to solve perimeter. And I have in the gutter, I have all the directions. You know, I want them to activate prior knowledge using Flipgrid, to explore the videos, to collaborate with a partner to create their own comic strip. And if they don't want to, I don't force them to collaborate. And to offer feedback to each other using Google Classroom, then to reflect upon their comic strip, and to create a presentation. And as you can see, I give them the choice. So. These are some of the choices I thought they could use, Powtoons, Google Slides, Flipgrid, Google Drawings, iMovie, Explain Everything. And then they were going to share their presentations with the grade level using Google Classroom. So a lot of people have asked me, how do I make the, the transparent JPEG images of myself? And I use a free app called Sticky. Al, I think it's Sticky Al, but somebody else told me it's Sticky AI. So um, it is called Sticky Al, I believe. And if you download it, you can then take a photograph, and it will get rid of the background. It's so easy. It takes two seconds, and you have a nice image. So when it comes to creating comic strips, that's a really fun tool to use. So students could take photographs of themselves, and the background would instantly be removed. If you go to my website or if you use the Live Binder, you should see some blank templates that you could use if you would like to have your students create comic strips. And you could modify this and switch it up as, as needed. But I find that comic strips in the classroom are really fun. And the Book Creator app, if you do have Book Creator, they have a nice comic strip template there as well. But Sticky Out is awesome, and it's free, and it's rated 4 plus, so you can use it with all your students. So here's another Google drawing, and this was designed for a teacher that wanted to incorporate hyper drawings into their ELA classroom. And students do a lot of work in their writer's notebook. So we wanted to still have them use their writer's notebook. So the first activity has them discussing, well, to explore a video about revising your lead. And this is a teacher-created screencast. And then I used Edpuzzle. Now what Edpuzzle does, and you can see the word Edpuzzle in step two, is it allows you to add questions into your videos or videos that you found on YouTube. And it's a great formative assessment tool, but it also keeps students active engaged while they're watching a video. And their results are saved into a screen into a spreadsheet so you can go back and look at all the answers. Also they took a photo of their writer's workshop notebooks and they added the image of their lead before the revisions. And then after they went through this hyper drawing and made the revisions, they took another photograph. So they ended up writing two leads overall and they typed in their favorite lead into the box over on the right. And then they received feedback from their classmates, which is so helpful in the writing, in the writing um, classroom. So getting that authentic feedback would help them revise and edit their work and think about places they may need to elaborate. And their peer editing partner would provide comments down below as well. And that collaboration piece, I think, is really helpful for our writers. And I'm glad that people think that these ideas can apply to middle school, because I honestly think that a lot of these activities can be applied to students of all levels. And if you are interested in using Google Drawings, I do have a template that you could use and modify. But as you can see, I have these eight ingredients here that I feel like are most successful with my students. So activate prior knowledge, explore, engage, create, collaborate, self-assess, share, and extend. So 
those are the, the ingredients to a successful hyperdoc, in my opinion. And I did talk about hyperdrawings on the TCEA podcast with Miguel Goulin. So if you are interested, the link is down at the bottom. And you can hear more about Google drawings or hyperdrawings, as I like to call them. So when it comes to differentiating with, with students, I like to use my formative assessment data and, of course, student individualized access, um, education plans to modify the directions or objectives, to modify the activities and the videos that I choose. Maybe the choice boards look different for different students. The collaboration piece might be different. And the enrichment or extension activities may change between students that access different hyperdocs. And I share the hyperdocs to students via Google Classroom, which allows you to send different hyperdocs to different students. And Seesaw is extremely popular in my school, especially with my K-2 teachers. So it seems like teachers in grades kindergarten through second grade tend to gravitate towards Seesaw, which is a student-driven portfolio tool. It is awesome. And then my students in grades three through five tend to gravitate more towards Google Classroom. So I know Seesaw can be used even at the college level. It just depends on what your preferences are. It's all subjective. But there are so many ways to differentiate for your students using HyperDocs. Google Docs is one of the most popular tools for creating HyperDocs. I tend to go on to Twitter and look for HyperDocs all the time, and I see so many amazing educators sharing these fabulous HyperDocs, and a lot of them are created with Google Docs. Here's an example of one I created for a book club. It's a poetry activity, and of course we activated prior knowledge, and I gave them multiple resources to explore. And then with their book club members, they looked for examples of figurative language in their text. And all the group members, you can see they're indicated by M1, M2, M3, or M4. All the group members contributed to this hyperdoc, and they added their quotations from the text and the page number so all their group members could easily reference these examples of figurative language within the text. And then in the create section in orange, you can see that they, the students had the choice of different tools to create a nice presentation explaining what they learned about the power of figurative language in a text. And to share their projects on a Padlet wall for students in their classroom or in classrooms around the world to access. So a lot of teachers are going online and they are finding teachers across the country to work with and have students share their work with different classrooms, which is a really nice way to motivate students. And then to self-assess their learning using a Google form. This is a hyperdoc I used in my computer classroom. Evaluating online sources is so important. And I had my students complete a hyperdoc where they're going to explore this fake website. I used the Pacific Northwest Tree Octopus website. And they were writing down things they learned on that website. And it was a riot because they did not realize that this website was being used for this purpose. Um, obviously, there is not a Northwest Tree Octopus out there. And then we talked about evaluating websites, and we looked at an infographic, and we watched a video on Brain Pop. And then they created their own infomercial explaining the importance of evaluating websites, because we know that students are very quick to go online, and they think that anything they find online has to be true because it's online, and that certainly is not the case. And then they shared their work with their classmates, and they left comments and feedback, and then they self-assessed their learning using Flipgrid. So that was a really fun activity that is on my website and in that URL with lots of different hyperdocs as well. So if you miss any of the hyperdocs that I've been referring to, if you go to the live binder, you will see a link to all of these activities that you can access, make a copy, and modify to your liking. Here's another book club activity. This was on identifying story elements. So here, students activated prior knowledge. They looked at three different um, 
tools to well they looked at three different resources and then they applied their knowledge doing a few fun to five different activities on character setting conflict plot and theme and then they created a presentation about story elements and shared and assessed their work and it was a very popular activity and the students had a lot of fun and that's what I've noticed about hyperdocs it really is engaging the students love creating they love sharing they love collaborating they love feedback. It is just an easy sell when it comes to introducing teachers to these activities because the students talk about the hyperdocs they've completed in computer class or with other teachers and the buzz about hyperdocs is out there and people are really interested in learning more. So in computer class, we use the dash and dot robots, which are so fun. These robots are created by Wonder Workshop and we have eight of them. And the math teachers in our school were really interested in how they, they could have their students use Dash to classify triangles. So we made this hyperdoc, and the hyperdoc teaches students about classifying triangles, and ultimately they create a code to program their robots to create to classify different triangles. So this was a really popular activity. The students had a lot of fun. There was laughter throughout the room and the enthusiasm was there and they were learning. So it was really integrating technology into the math curriculum and it was very engaging. Now, you don't have to have the same template. So I know some teachers say, okay, well, I have this template and I have to stick to this template. A lot of us are type A, but you do not have to be. You can switch it up. So this is a template about um, Plymouth Plantation, the first Thanksgiving, and this is set up very differently. So you can see that across the top, going horizontal, I have that in yellow, students will activate prior knowledge for every single activity that we did. So we went to different locations in Plymouth, and we activated prior knowledge before we explored every single resource. And then we did a reflection after every single resource as well. And then I have create and extend up at the top with the link to share in purple. So there is no one size fits all. Your hyperdoc could look completely different than my hyperdocs. And that's awesome because it's all about finding something that works for you. It's not about the hyperdoc, it's about the activity. We are also exploring hyperdocs when it comes to teacher-led professional development. So I was working with the math coach at my school who is very open to using technology with her teachers. And we were talking about how we can differentiate for different teachers when it comes to professional development. So this hyperdoc was actually created for teachers who were going to look at multiplication fact fluency. And for activating prior knowledge, they were going to think about their students and the lessons that they have used with their students. And then we put a section where they could explore different resources and where they could collaborate with their peers and discuss different teaching practices. And then we were introducing them to Flipgrid. That's where they would have their discussion. So we also had a tutorial on how to use Flipgrid included for some students, for some teachers that have used Flipgrid and some that may have not even heard of Flipgrid before. And then together with their partners, they were going to create an activity or a lesson plan for their fact fluency center and then share and reflect with other teachers. And we were going to use a Padlet to share our lesson planning. And of course, we included a Padlet tutorial because some teachers have used Padlet and some have not. So we tried to differentiate within the HyperDoc for technology as well as the experience teaching multiplication fact fluency. So I am very excited to continue developing HyperDocs for Teacher PD as well. And I think teachers will be very appreciative of this because I know as educators, we are all in different places. Some of us have been teaching for a long time. Some of us, some of us are brand new. And the same with technology. Some of us have been using technology for a very long time and some of us have not. So it's great to differentiate not just for students, but for teachers. So here's a Flipgrid HyperDoc that I created for educators in the elementary classroom. And it allowed them to explore this tool because I think Flipgrid is one of the best tools out there right now. And that's what led me to become a Flipgrid ambassador. I'm just using it all the time. I'm so passionate about it. And I think it's just a fabulous tool for students and teachers to use to learn and share. 
So here's an example of a technology workshop for the elementary school class teachers that was used to differentiate four teachers. So we had teachers activate prior knowledge and to explore four different resources, to create their own Flipgrid, to collaborate with their peers, and to reflect on Flipgrid and if they think it would be a good tool for their classrooms. And then, of course, the extension piece, which is huge. So I like to try to include that as well. So here are some example HyperDoc templates. If you like Google Docs, you like the way it looks, if you go into the live binder or on my website, fliptechcoaching.com, you will find some templates that I created. And of course, you could modify it. Just go to File, make a copy, and you have your own copy that you can switch up. And I'm sure as the years go by, you'll continue modifying them like I do. So if you want a template, there you go. Google Slides is probably my second favorite tool for HyperDocs. I absolutely love Google Slides, and there are so many activities that you can do within Google Slides. So I quickly want to show you some examples. Here's one that we created for Martin Luther King Jr., for Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day, where we research Dr. Martin Luther King and we learn about him and we create a presentation. I included this choice board. As you can see, I have videos in the slideshow from Kid President, who is awesome. If you don't know Kid President, you need to Google him. He is fabulous and we use him in class. And students are engaging and exploring multiple resources. And one of the main reasons why I like Google Slides so much is you can chunk the activities. So I like how every slide has a different topic on it, and it just seems to me visually that chunking the activities using Google Slides just makes it much easier for some students that may be overwhelmed when they look at a hyperdoc or a hyperdrawing and they see all these activities. It might be overwhelming to some students. So Google Slides allows me to chunk my different activities, so each slide can have a different activity, and that may be less intimidating to some students. We also use Dash, my favorite robot, to measure the perimeter of a rectangle. So I used this in a computer class. Actually, this was a coaching lesson with a student, with a teacher, rather. And we wanted to measure the perimeter of a rectangle. So we used Dash, the robot. And we had all sorts of activities where students would click and drag text boxes to create their own code. and to extend and reflect on their code. So here's an extension activity. And the students were dragging the text boxes over to, to create their own code. Book snaps, my favorite, and I love Tara Martin's post. I've learned so much from her. So I love using Google Drawings for my book snaps. So to introduce the whole concept of book snaps to my students and teachers, I created a slideshow, a hyperdoc hyperslide, whatever you want to call it. And once again, we activated prior knowledge about coding or annotating text using Flipgrid, my favorite. And you can see over here in slide four, I put in some example um, codes that you might use while coding the text, like C if you're showing a connection. And I also have an example book snap. So here's an example where I took a picture. So if you're in any Google app, if you go to insert image, there's the take a snapshot option. So in Google Drawings or Google Slides, if you go to insert image, you can take a snapshot of the text, and then you can insert text boxes to talk about the text. And once again, I use that Sticky Al or Sticky AI app to add my thinking. So in one of the images, I have my finger on my chin because I'm wondering something about the text. And then another image, I have the thumbs down because I don't like this part of the text. So I really love book snaps. And we're actually even doing math snaps, where we're taking pictures of math problems. And we're adding our thinking and underlining keywords and talking about our strategies. So next, I would like to make a coding math snaps hyper slideshow. That's on my list of things to do. So here's the app, Sticky Al, and it converts selfies into stickies. And it is free, and it's great. And you can also create the animated GIF. So you can have a lot of fun with that. Google My Maps 
love it. One of my other favorite Google tools. It really allows students to dive in and get an authentic experience exploring different locations. So this hyper slideshow or hyper doc, whatever you want to call it, hyper docs is the umbrella term used for all the different Google apps. So some teachers don't realize that, that when you say hyper docs, you could also be referring to Google Slides or Google Drawings. So in this activity, the students are creating, um, they're exploring Google My Maps, and they're looking at major rivers around the world. These are second graders, and they're exploring um, rivers. And if you look down at the bottom, you can see the little map icon. That means they're going to explore the location. So if you haven't checked out My Maps, you need to do that. And here are my favorite tools overall when I make when I'm creating my hyperdocs for activating prior knowledge, Flipgrid, Bokaroo, any Google app. You could even use the commenting tool to discuss your prior knowledge, Padlet, Screencast. So for engaging students, my favorite thing to do is to give them a screencast that is created by the teacher. But you can also go to Khan Academy, YouTube, play different games, go to websites, talk on Seesaw, Google Classroom, participate in a blog. Creation. I love giving students the choice to collaborate and create using the tool of their choice. So once again, as long as it is allowed to be used in your district and it does have the appropriate age, like four plus if you're in the elementary school, then don't be afraid if you are not the expert. Empower the students to take charge of their learning and figure out how to use the tool. And of course, provide a tutorial if you want. And you don't have to create the tutorial. There are millions on YouTube. And then sharing. It is just so huge. So Google Classroom is one of the most popular sharing tools. But we also use Padlet and Seesaw. And we love Seesaw because you can open it up to parents. And parents can see their child's work. They can't see anybody else's work, but only they can only see the work of their child. And if anybody else is tagged on their child's work, so if your child had a partner, they could see that child as well. But that is it. And then Vimeo is great for sharing, or YouTube, or QR codes. We print out QR codes all the time, and we share them in the hallways, on our bulletin boards, online. You could put them on your school website. So sharing is huge, and you won't believe the level, the increase in motivation when students have that authentic audience. And then finally, self-assessing. I think that's huge. And the instant feedback is huge as well, because I really believe that once you give the grade, Students don't really care about the project anymore. So I like giving the instant feedback where students are going to go back, and make modifications, and really reflect. And the grade should be the last thing to go out, in my opinion. I feel like the feedback should be there, and the grade is the last thing that you have to worry about. So my three favorite tools, overall, Screencastify. You have to have it. You can record for up to 10 minutes free. It saves to your Google Drive. It publishes to YouTube. You can put your little webcam um, in the corner so that students can see your face. Students can use it to record their thinking. That's my favorite. We have iPads and Chromebooks in our school, and hopefully someday we will be going one-to-one. -one. I do also have the premium account for myself because I use Screencastify on a daily basis. So that's what it looks like. It's so intuitive. Tab allows students to draw with a marker and highlighter, and they just click record. And if you click desktop, then you can record your entire computer screen. Flipgrid is my very favorite app for sharing. You can upload your videos and your final projects onto Flipgrid. So you don't have to use Flipgrid just for recording student faces and student discussions. You can up load student videos and creations onto Flipgrid. So if your students made a bunch of tutorials that explain everything, you can upload onto the Flipgrid and then get feedback and likes from classmates or from people around the world. So I love using Flipgrid. And Explain Everything is just a fabulous iPad app. It is a paid app, and it is also available now on your Chromebooks and computers. So that's relatively new. I haven't explored Explain Everything on the computer yet. I've been using it primarily on the iPad, but it is definitely on my to-do list. Now, if you are interested in evaluating your HyperDocs to see if you're on the right track to creating awesomeness, I do have a checklist in the Live Binder and on my website 
flipteccoaching.com, and you could use this evaluation checklist to see, you know, if you are allowing students to activate prior knowledge and to have choice and voice to explore multiple resources and tools, if students are able to collaborate with peers. Ultimately, what about peers from around the world, not just in their classroom? If they are demonstrating their understanding by creating, and if they are self-assessing and reflecting on their work, and sharing their reflections, and making changes to their work, and changing their thinking based on their reflections, and that authentic audience piece, which is so huge, and such a huge motivator when it comes to student work. Um, if you go to Padlet.com, slash Mora KD, with, you can see the code right here. Kylie Mora has amazing, she has a Padlet wall out, that, out there with thousands of HyperDocs that educators have contributed to. Um, it is a fabulous resource, so I wanted to include that. But teachers around the world are sharing their HyperDocs and giving others permission to share and modify the HyperDocs they have created with credit, of course. It, so this is a great resource if you're looking for more ideas. Check out this Padlet wall that Carly Mora put out there for everybody. And the ladies at HyperDocs LLC, they're the ones who I believe actually coined the phrase HyperDoc. They have an amazing website out there. They have a great book, and they are curating tons of links and resources. So that's another fabulous website to check out. And there's also the Give One, Take One at Teachers Give Teachers, where you can get a HyperDoc, but you have to give one first, or you have to share a resource. So there are amazing educators out there sharing their, their high quality resources for free, and there are some great um, paid resources out there as well. So thank you so much for joining me. I would love to answer any of your questions today. Wow, just wow, Julie. This has been so fantastic. I'm so glad it's being recorded because I think we're all going to want to go back and pause as we go through the recording and actually explore all of those great resources that you included on your slides. So everyone needs to realize that they're all clickable when you look at the presentation link on the live binder. So we are going to have such an amazing time exploring and sharing. So thank you so much. I didn't collect too many questions, and a couple of them you picked up on. But um, one thing um, I'm curious about that a couple people mentioned their disappointment in not being able to use Google Drawing on the iPad. Do you know of any workarounds to that? I do not, but I promise you if I do find a workaround, I will be the first to tweet about it because that would be amazing, wouldn't it? Yes, it would, and that would be so terrific. I love all those um, short tutorials, video tutorials that you do on all of these different um, tools and uses for HyperDucks that we talked about today because it's so helpful to be able to see you demonstrate it being used. So that's terrific. And we'll just keep watching for your tweet. Also, um, Maureen was well, wondering. Great. Yes, <laughs> Maureen was wondering. Do you have student accounts in all of the third-party apps and websites? And if so, who supervises them? Could you repeat that one more time? I'm sorry. Do I have student accounts? Do you have student sure. accounts in all of the third-party apps and websites? And if so, who supervises them? She says she has a long list. Give students accounts, but it takes so much time. Sure. Well, and that's one of the reasons why I like tools such as Seesaw and Flipgrid. The students do yes. not have to create accounts, so I can give them a code and they can go and create their response without having an account. So in the same with Seesaw. So students can scan a code to access the activity or assignment, but they do not have to have their own account. So students in our district do have a G Suite account they start using in second grade, but our younger users are, are not accessing their own G Suite account at this time. 
So I really look for tools like that. So that's just another reason. Same with Padlet. Yes. Students do not need to have an account. They can just click on your Padlet wall and get the response. And also the privacy settings are great. You can password protect your walls and you can really get, get really specific with your settings. Oh, those are all great suggestions. Susie, go Patty ahead. Just, oh, Patty just mentioned about Powtoons because that's one that you uh, referenced that it's a 13 and up unless you have a classroom account. So how do you manage that? Right. So my students are not using Powtoons in in class, but there are different um, teachers that are using Powtoons in middle school and high school. But it's good to make okay. choice boards that you can differentiate. Yes. Okay. And then we had another question. Or when you, you have share the classroom students, account, sure. Sure. When you share with the HyperDocs with the students, do they make a copy of your slide or doc, or do you give them a published link? Well, here's a little shortcut that might, you might find very handy. If you look at your link, when you share a link, if you delete everything after the word, starting with the E in edit, you'll see the word edit in your link. If you start with the E in edit and delete everything after, you can change the word edit to the word copy. And when you share that link, it's going to force students to make a copy which is a great, great little hack there. And another hack you can do is if you erase everything from the word edit on and you change the word to um, template, it will provide a preview first. Actually, you change it to the word preview. It will give them a template to preview and then make a copy. So those are some little hacks there. But um, it's, I think it's much easier if you share it and it forces students to make a copy. Thank you. That was really important for us to know about. I'll be sure that we add a link in the live binder about the instructions for forcing a copy, because that's really important for us to know. And one last question. Um, Paula was curious if you've had students create any hyperdocs. You know what, that's funny that she asked that because that has been something on my mind. I think that would be a fabulous way for to empower students, to have them create their own hyperdocs and to share their learning by creating something that other students could be engaged in. So I think creating a hyperdoc could go in the choice board there of things to create. So that's a wonderful question and something I have not done yet, but I definitely look forward to doing. Oh, that's great. I, I think students would really love doing that. And we know that when they're creating videos or hyperdocs or Flipgrids or anything like that, they're, and they're teaching someone else, they're really reinforcing their own learning. So, so that's super. Well, thank you again, Jolie, for such an excellent, excellent, inspiring session. And I can't wait to get it published so everyone will be able to go back and watch it. So we'll just go on. We're through our questions. I'd just like to say thank you to all of you that joined us today. And we have some super shows coming up every Saturday. So next Saturday, we're going to be hearing from a Meredith Akers who is an elementary assistant principal. And she has some awesome things to share with us. It's going to be a super follow-up to this session, because she's going to talk about strategies for students to become creators, and things like creating animated videos, um, to creating voice command, choose your own adventure stories creating your own GIFs, memes, and many more strategies. So I know you're going to enjoy that. The following week on March 24th, Paula Fellinger is going to be our featured teacher. She's a second grade teacher and is going to be sharing tons of great things they're doing in their classroom. We will take the uh, weekend off of Easter weekend in the United States. But on April 7th, Sarah Malchow is going to be doing a bunch of things with global collaboration through online experiences. 
And April 14th, we're going to hear from Pooja Agarwal, and she has some really neat things to share with us on brain and memory and things that are really practical for what we can do with students to support their learning. April 21st, Jennifer Regruth in fourth grade is going to be our April featured teacher. And April 28th, Matt Miller is joining us once again. This time he's going to be talking about 10 things to ditch in education and what you can do instead. So I hope you'll come back and join us any Saturday you can. And know that we will record everything. So if you can't make it to the live session, then plan on um, watching the recording and checking out the live binders. And we do want to say a special thank you to Steve Hargadon, who is our mentor and co-host. And he has tons of great things going on on the learning revolution. So check out that link, which is in the live binder. We also love our featured teachers. So please, if you would like to be a featured teacher, don't be shy. Or if you know someone who's really terrific that you think would be a great featured teacher, please fill in that form. It's in the live binder. And give us some contact information, and we'll reach out to them. We do publish all of our recordings, both in iTunes U and also in on um, YouTube. So the links, again, for those things are in the live binder. And you can subscribe to those, and then you won't miss out on anything. Don't forget to fill in the survey if you would like a PD certificate for today. And you can even get certificates for recordings that you watch. So be sure to bookmark our uh, website in the archives and then complete the surveys anytime um, there's a recording that you watch. It's important to use a personal email address if you can on your survey because sometimes the school districts block the PD certificates when we send them out if you're using a school website. So if you want to make sure you get it, use a personal email address for that. And special thank you to Jolie Boucher, to Steve Hargadon, to Blackboard Collaborate for our webinar platform, and to all of you who took your time on a Saturday to continue your learning. Thanks, everyone. Have a super weekend. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.